will be the subject of tonight's discussion. Please join me in welcoming Katie Sewell and Tiffany Parks. Welcome to Rome. This is The Bittersweet Life with Katie Sewell and Tiffany Parks. <laughs> Hello, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. Thanks for coming, everybody. Yes. <laughs> wow, we're doing a live show. For those of you who don't know, that's how the show always starts. So um, We are here celebrating uh, the 200th episode of the Bittersweet Life podcast. I know. Oh. <laughs> Katie does believe. all of the editing herself. Just FYI, most podcasts have a producer who does the editing and all of that stuff. In our case, Katie does all of that. Right. Yeah, great. Uh, <laughs> someday, right? Um, and of course, we're also here to celebrate the release of Tiffany's first book, Midnight in the Piazza. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> of which there are copies available for sale back there um, today. And uh, I want to thank Town Hall, uh, my old place of employment, for inviting us to do this here. Um, of course, I wasn't really wanting to do it anywhere else. So thanks for agreeing, you guys. I really appreciate it. <laughs> right, thank you. Um, all right, so I figured we'd start by having Tiffany lay out a little bit what the book's about, just for those of you who don't listen every week and haven't heard about it a million times. Well, first of all, the, the Midnight in the Piazza is specifically for 8 to 12-year-olds, but I think, I think it can be enjoyed by people of all ages. I know I enjoy books written for children, so um, if you don't have kids in your life, that doesn't necessarily mean you won't enjoy it. Um, so the book takes place in the city of Rome, obviously. The Rome, Rome is my muse. It's where I get all of my inspiration. And I got the inspiration for this story from a gorgeous fountain that maybe some of you know called the Turtle Fountain. And it's probably the most beautiful fountain in Rome, wouldn't you say? I would agree. And there's an amazing legend behind this fountain that it was built in one night. And when I heard this legend, I had to investigate. I had to find out more about it. And I also knew that someday that legend was going to come into a story in some way. And several years after I learned about that legend, I uh, decided I wanted to start writing uh, fiction. I wanted to write something set in Rome, um, <laughs> but I didn't know I didn't, I didn't want to write something that would, you know, just be one of hundreds and hundreds of books that, uh, that were set, you know, that were an expat living in Rome, living in a new place. So I decided to make it different. I would have my protagonist be a kid, a 13-year-old. And, uh, and so that's how the story sort of began. And my, my protagonist lives in the square where that fountain is and can see it from her bedroom window. And the, in the opening chapters, she witnesses... Uh, first of all, she learns about the legend, and secondly, she witnesses the turtles from the top of the fountain being stolen, and she has to investigate and figure out what happened. No one believes her story. She ends up go getting in a lot of adventures, climbing on rooftops and discovering ancient yes. diaries and going through secret passageways and underground ruins, and um, she has a big, bit of an adventure. Yeah, she, um, it's, a, it's, a gr it's exactly the book I would have wanted to read at that time. Um, and as an adult, she does several things where I'm just like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> um, <laughs> Kate, so Katie also, I should mention, Katie read, how many drafts did you read? Two at two. least, maybe three? No, just two. Two drafts she read and gave me excellent advice and help that helped make the book um, what, it, what it became. And so I will be forever indebted to you for that. Thank you. Um, so the book when I was living in Rome, which is back in 2013, 14, when we started this podcast, was holding together, but... Tiffany was feeling like, for whatever reason, uh, she had made all of these separate clues, she told all these different legends, and she was having a hard time going, this is actually holding together and making sense. Like, yes. And while I was living in Rome, she wrote one of the pivotal chapters that kind of locked the book together. And it has a central theme of synchronicity, which is what we're actually going to talk about. We always try to talk about a theme on the show. We try not to just talk randomly. So we figured we'd do synchronicity tonight, but to start, why don't you read your characters explaining what synchronicity is? Sure. Just to give you a little bit of background, because this is kind of near the back of the book, um, <clears throat> Beatrice has been investigating, and she's kind of finding that sometimes 
her, um, her investigation leads her to very auspicious things that just seem to work out for her. And she finds something and it seems like too good, of a, too good to be true, too big of a coincidence. And her little partner in crime, who's a skeptic, uh, says, you know, these aren't clues, these are just coincidences. And so she's really feeling, she's really struggling to know whether she's, she's really following clues or whether she's just, you know, following her own hunches. Yeah, making things up. M making things up and making connections where they don't exist. And so she runs into her next door neighbor, who's an elderly lady, an elderly Italian lady, and she, she gives her a little bit of advice. So Beatrice says, strange coincidences just keep pushing me in the right direction. At least I hope it's the right direction. For example, Mirella sat even straighter, if that were possible. Well, the other day I was looking for some very specific information, and I just happened to find this, this book uh, that told me everything I needed to know. And I, kept meeting, and I keep meeting people who know all about the subject I'm researching. And I know it sounds crazy, but I saw this painting, and I somehow felt like it was communicating with me somehow. She looked down, afraid she'd said too much. It's as if everywhere I turn, whatever I'm looking for pops up right under my nose, even when I didn't know I was looking for it. For a long moment, Mirella said nothing, but sat perfectly still with fire in her eyes. Finally, she spoke. What you are experiencing is synchronicity, cara mia. <laughs> synchronicity? Beatrice liked the way the word felt in her mouth, the crunch of the consonants as they bumped up against each other, the way each syllable danced across her tongue. Whatever it meant, it had to be something wonderful. Synchronicity is the theory of meaningful coincidence. Meaningful coincidence. The words didn't seem to go together. According to the theory of synchronicity, Mirella said, nothing happens entirely by chance. When you focus on something with enough intensity, with enough clarity of purpose, in your small way, you participate in the creative process of the universe. Events intermesh, opportunities present themselves, people who have the means to help you are thrown into your path, all bringing you toward your goal. Such as you running into me, for example, she continued. You think it was just a coincidence? Let me ask you, what were you doing just before we met on the landing? Beatrice thought for a moment. I'd been feeling really doubtful about this, um, this project I'm working on and, and was on the point of giving up, actually. Then I realized I just had to keep going. I have to get to the bottom of this. Vidi, you see? You made a commitment and the universe acknowledged it. Think back to all the other times you notice these strange coincidences, as you call them. You find they are not coincidences at all, but the responses of an invisible force prodding you along. A world of possibility opened before Beatrice. Still, her skeptical side told her it was too good to be true. How does it work? Don't worry about how. Not yet, anyway. For now, just be aware. Pay attention to what is all around you, and you'll feel the universe synchron synchronize with your own consciousness. So, <laughs> synchronicity. Uh, why were you thinking about synchronicity when you wrote that chapter? Well, first I should say it's a, it's a concept that I adore. It's something that I just, I just the first time I heard about it, I, I was like, this is the coolest thing ever, and I started to see ways that it had worked in my own life. And to be honest, though, when I came up with the idea, as Katie said, I had already drafted the story. I was probably five or six drafts in, but I felt like there was some hole in the middle that wasn't holding all the parts together. And it was like, I was lying, I was actually lying in bed one night, and I was about to fall asleep, and I was going over and over the plot in my head, and the word just popped into my head. Synchronicity, synchronicity. It's a little voice calling to me. And I said, that is it. That is a way that I can connect all of these dots in a, in a way that some people might consider magical, some people might consider totally bogus, um, and some people might consider, you know, synchronicity. And it was, I don't want to call it a cheat, but maybe a little bit. I, dis <laughs> I disagree, because when you added that chapter, all of a sudden it snapped for me. It, it, so that was the... You read before and after that chapter, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Because before, I'm like, how are these things connected? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but it is something, you say it's a concept that you love. Is it something that you believe in, that you've seen in your own life? 
I do. I do believe in it. Do you want to tell a story? Um, <laughs> no. Well, coming up with coming <laughs> up with the idea to put it in the book was that maybe? No. Sure. Yeah. No. Tell me. I'll tell you. Um, I was trying to find an agent for this book about six months after this whole edition happened. I, I kind of had felt like the book was ready to be seen by the world, and I'd started to look for an agent. And if any of you out there have done that, you know what a terribly disheartening um, act that can be, a project that can be. And so after several months of this and having no, um, no bites, I said, you know what, I got to take a month off from this querying process and I got to start a new project. I got to focus on my writing again because I'd been focusing all this, on all this sort of business aspect of it and I wanted to focus on the writing. So I started writing a sequel. And I, I participated in, a, in an event called National Novel Writing Month, which um, you basically try to write an entire novel or a 50,000 word novel in one single month. And so I just threw myself into it and I wrote the sequel to Midnight in the Piazza in one month. Very, very rough draft. Scarily rough. Um, but it has I not finished. been seen. It has not been I seen guess. by anyone but my eyes. Um, so I finished this draft on November 30th got it done in time, was like super excited, had been very focused on the writing aspect. Uh, and the next day, I saw online um, advertised an event, a Twitter event, to try to f get your work in front of agents. And without going into too many details, it's, uh, it's, it's the way I found my agent. It was through that event. And it just happened right on the heels of me finishing this month-long intensive period of writing. And I feel like why did that feel like synchronicity, though? Why did that not well, just feel like, all, it, oh, yeah, I was working on getting an agent. I mean, you know, see, <laughs> is a skeptic. If you listen to the show, you know that I'm the optimist. I'm the one who believes in fairy tales. I'm becoming tales more optimistic. And legends. And, Slowly. And Katie's a bit of a, she's a bit more of a skeptic. I'm I always a foot say, dragger. Which I don't understand. I'm a reluctant because changer. Because Katie, as you know, is a little bit on the short side. Yeah. I mean, I am too, quite frankly. Yeah. But right. Katie's even shorter. And I say, well, if you're short... You, you're usually an optimist because you're so down so low that the glass always looks half full. <laughs> <laughs> I like to sit above but, my glass. But in Katie's, in Katie's uh, situation, that's not, that's not the case. No, <laughs> I choose to think of it as that way. And if it had been the only time that that happened in my life, maybe I would just chalk it up to coincidence. But I prefer the idea of a meaningful coincidence. Maybe I was so focused on... Um, my creative process that something clicked, you know, mm -hmm. in the universe, call it whatever you want, God, the universe, that opened up that pathway for me because I was ready. Okay. Can I tell you a story? Yeah. Or actually, Dad, can I tell your story? <laughs> my dad's here. Uh, Dale Sewell, everyone. Um, <laughs> so we were talking earlier today, and I was asking him about synchronicity and me. And I came up with an example for me, eventually. But he had a few that rolled off uh, his head, although he probably wouldn't have called them synchronicity. So I want to tell you his, and you tell me if you think it is. Because I'm the judge of synchronicity. You, you are the judge. <laughs> you guys can clap or applaud if you think it is. Anyway, so I'm going to do the cliff note version. Anyone who listens to the show a lot knows that me and my father used to travel to Vietnam together a lot and that he was doing a lot of work over there um, when I was in my 20s. And I don't know that I was on this trip, but in one trip he's, on, he's at a hotel and he meets this young Vietnamese couple who are having their honeymoon and he gets to talking with them about their lives. And he finds out that the woman of the couple's father was... Uh, an ambassador to Sri Lanka from Vietnam. Uh, and she says, oh yes, you should meet him. And eventually, after striking up a bit of a friendship, my father meets this man. His name is Quinn. And my father's at Quinn's house at one point and is walking along looking at the pictures on the wall and notices that he was a uh, participant in the Vietnam War, as many people were. And he asked him, well, what did you do in the Vietnam War? And he said, my job was to, when an uh, American pilot got shot out of the sky, my job was to try to get to that pilot and rescue him before uh, the, the people in the north got to him and killed him. So that was my job. And my dad said, well, did you rescue anyone? And he said, I rescued one person. And that person ended up being Lieutenant Schumacher. 
<laughs> Lieutenant Schumacher, this was back in 1966, uh, 40 years before my father meets the daughter of this man. Lieutenant Schumacher happened to be the only pilot that was rescued, or probably the only pilot at all, that was from my dad's small town of New Wilmington, Pennsylvania. That is incredible. So now that, and of course, him and Quinn went on to do good things together in Vietnam from that, but is that a coincidence or is that a synchronicity? I don't know, that's a hard one. I think it's one of those really extraordinary and beautiful coincidences that, um, that kind of give me goosebumps. But I feel like with synchronicity, it's, um, it's more um, in the present and not necessarily something from the past. Like it's something that's gonna change your reality right now. So it's a door that's gonna open for you or it's an opportunity you're gonna have. Somebody comes into your life that you didn't know you needed and they come in at the right time. Um, when this happened to me when I was 15 years old, I fell in love with opera. I decided that I wanted to be an opera singer. Um, didn't quite turn out like that, but that was my decision at 15. And I wanted to take voice lessons. And my mom got on the phone and got in touch with some people who knew you know, who to go to and found the name of this voice teacher who much later, we discovered was a really, really bad voice teacher. We didn't know this at the time. Um, so she, 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 she gets in touch with this voice teacher. She sets up an appointment, uh, first lesson for me. And it's like a day away or two days away. And my mom happens to be in the garden or in the lawn. And, you know, she sees her next door neighbor. How are you? What are you doing? Oh, Tiffany's going to start voice lessons with so-and-so. <gasps> no. I know a voice teacher who's amazing. She just moved here from California. You have to send your daughter to her. So my mom said, okay, we'll give it a try. I end up going to study with that voice teacher who changed my life. She, she inspired me to go to university and study opera. Now, the fact that I didn't become an opera singer, I don't think that makes a difference in the story because she nevertheless changed the path of my life and inspired me in a way that only teachers can, and, uh, and so I think, I think that's synchronicity. I love the story about your dad, Do you but think <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like it has to involve, it has to change the future. It doesn't, like the past, it, it doesn't change anything. Do you see what I mean? Okay, I have another story. Okay. Uh, and I guess the central question of this story is, does it have to change your future in a big way or not? Don't answer that yet. I'm gonna tell this one really briefly too. So. There was a day when I was growing up when me and my sister were driving in a car and in front of the car ran a baby, baby duckling. We didn't run it over, but it did go screaming across the street, peeping its head off. And my family has always been a family that says a stray duck, sure, it can live in the house. Is that quacky? No, that was not quacky. That was the character I used to play. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> kind of confused. <laughs> Not going there. Um, <laughs> anyway, she eventually was called Ducky. But So the duck goes screaming across the street. Me and my sister immediately pull the car over because we're saying, if anybody knows how to take care of a duck that doesn't have a mother anymore, it's us. And we spend the next hour looking for this duck, and it's vanished. And she finally has to leave to go to work. And so I say, I'm not leaving it. I'm going to go around the block one more time. And I start walking around the block, and midway around the block, I just, you know, I'm a kid at this point, I'm like a middle schooler, and I'm so disheartened, you know, because I've been looking for so long, and I just sit down, and I'm like, just in this last walk around the block, show up, pop out from whatever fence you're under, something, and I get up, and I start walking again, I probably walk for all of one minute, and a car pulls over, creepy. <laughs> <laughs> the woman rolls down the window and she says, I'm sorry, are you looking for something? And I said, yeah, um, I'm looking for a baby duckling. And she says, oh, it's in the back seat of my car. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I promised my kid we'd take it to church, but I can bring it to your house afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> to church? Yeah. And so she brought it over afterwards and that's how we ended up living with a mallard. Now, would you say that that's synchronicity? I, I, think, I think it is. What do you guys think? I think it is. Sure. Because you, you made a request of the universe or God or whatever you want to say, you know, however you want to put it. But you opened yourself up and you were like, okay, this is what I want to happen. And I'm going to 
do the action, which is taking the last l lap around the block. But what if I hadn't done that? What if I had just taken the last lap around the block and the woman had pulled over and I said, are you looking for something? I don't know, Katie. It's the intentionality of me looking for something. I think, I, I think intentionality is a big part of it. And I think, you know, you never know. Maybe if she had stopped and asked you, you might not have said, I'm looking for a duck. You might have felt stupid and said, you know, no. Or maybe you wouldn't have had, this is me just creating stuff. She's a fiction writer. Yeah, maybe if you hadn't made that call to the universe, you wouldn't have had the intention that you had in your face that made her stop. Mm. Could be? <laughs> She's not convinced. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how do you know that if somebody says the right thing or does the right thing or whatever for your moment, and I have a story for this if you don't know what I'm talking about, that gives you the context to think about what's already happening in a different way. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> that came out really weird. Let me try that again. <laughs> Something's already happening. Okay, let me just tell you a story. Okay. <laughs> this is going to be brief because I've been telling too many stories. So I'm working for Radio Lab in New York City. Some of you listen to that show, I think. Uh, Jad Abumrad, who's the host, and I are talking in his office. I'm asking for his advice. And I said, what's your number one piece of advice that you would give me? I was working on weekday at the time, for those of you who know KUW. One piece of advice for us, or for me, in our radio career. And he'd say, well, the best thing that ever happened to me was that I found my area of benign neglect. And I would recommend that you look for that. Benign neglect. And what he meant by that was, I honed my skill as a radio person when nobody was paying attention. You know, he w and he actually started in literally in the middle of the night when nobody was paying attention, and he started experimenting. Well, I got back, and I don't remember if Steve Scher, who's the host of my show, who's sitting in the back back there, um, was in on this conversation or not, but so I think you were, and somewhere along the way, we realized that maybe the area of benign neglect was our show, because we were already considered successful enough we were like the two-hour morning flagship show. We knew that our boss didn't really listen to it that much. <laughs> <laughs> and we got pretty experimental. <laughs> and in that, like, you could consider that in a synchronicity, or you could, could say that what Jad did was highlight what was already going on in a different context that made me feel about it in a different way. Oh, you're going deep now. Yeah, so now. That's my last example. So what do you think about that one? Um, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's almost like I need to think about that for a while. Um, I don't have my editor who can, like, <laughs> cut out. Oops. This is the thing about uh, that you don't know if you listen to the show is that Tiffany often um, will, uh, it's not really that she looks for thoughts, but she often looks for words because I she forget speaks words. Italian most of the time, <clears throat> so she can't remember English. Yeah, it's happens so to me all say, the time. She'll say, I, I got this, hang on. And we'll just sit there for... And she'll l kindly cut out and the, I cut it. The, the, the thinking. Um, but... Because <laughs> sometimes it goes on for a long time. It does. Um, but, so she's put me on the spot here, but I think that I think that, that could be considered a, a subcategory of synchronicity. I think, I think it's also, no, you know, just being aware and noticing things. But that's part of synchronicity. Yeah. So do you think that as far as your book is concerned, could that chat, could the book exist without that chapter, in your opinion, at this point? It could, ex you mean, could it have been published? Not in a different reality, but like, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, would it have been picked up? Would it have been? Do you think that it, it's as important a chapter as I think it is? I think it is. I think it is. Yeah. I mean, I think that, was, I'll be honest with you, when I started writing this book, I had no idea where it was going. Like, I didn't know it was even going to be a mystery. I was just like, yeah. And I finally came to a plot, eventually, and um, resolved it. But there were, there were a few holes in the middle. And so I've learned from my mistake. I don't do that anymore. But it was my first shot, so, you know, you can't blame me, right? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I think that if I had completed it as it was without inserting the synchronicity aspect, it would probably have seemed a little bit weak. Like there, it would have been, it would have stretched the imagination to think that 
my character who's 13 and has never been to Rome before and just shows up and, you know, starts solving a mystery, that she would be able to have access to all of this knowledge that she picks up if there wasn't some kind of pseudo-magical, mystical thing that was sort of helping her out. Yeah. Can I go in a totally different direction for a second? Go. I, this happens too sometimes. Um, because two questions just occurred to me that have nothing to do with synchronicity at all. One is the fact of the matter that you're married to an Italian man. I am. That is, uh, who is learning English but does not speak English extremely fluently. No, he speaks it well, but I wouldn't say fluently. Can he read your book? Yeah, he can read. He's read books in English before. Okay, I was curious about that. Yeah. I should have asked you that a long time ago. Cause I, yeah. Well, that just derailed me because I was going to say, what's that like? You know, if he doesn't, so cut that bit. Yeah, um, I was going to cut that. <laughs> It's not interesting. Um, yeah, he can read in English, but he hasn't read the book yet. But the reason is because he wanted to wait until it was published, and then I said, I don't want you to read it while I'm not in Rome. You did or you didn't? I said that. I don't, don't re wait till I get back to read it, because I want to be like over his shoulder being like, what are you thinking? What do you think? Isn't it, what do you think of it? You know? Like, what do you think of that chapter? Wasn't that good? That's going to be fun. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I don't want him to read it when I'm not there. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, and then as far as going forward, we've talked about this a little bit on the book, but, or on the show, but um, are you, go you going to be an author now? What's, what's going on? Well, I thought I was an author <laughs> already. <laughs> full time, full time. That's my dream. That's the dream. Well, full time with podcasting. With podcasting, and podcasting on the side, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's my hope. Um, if the book sells, you know, uh, maybe then I'll get some more offers. Yeah, that's my hope. I have a whole series planned for this story. Uh, I've got this, as you know, the sequel is is drafted, um, and I'm working on a totally other project as well that has nothing to do with Beatrice, but it is set in Rome, obviously. So let's do. I want to take. I want to leave time for questions, but I want. Let's do one more synchronicity quandary. Uh huh. Okay. So I work, I'm one of those people that gets a job and kind of just climbs up the ladder, or I was. I'm not really anymore. Um, I, I'm different now. But Since I was. Rome, <laughs> she, went to, she went to Rome, and Rome killed her ambition. See, that's what happens when you go to Italy. Yeah, I just have to sudden, mainly work for you're free. You're like, I'm just going to hang out and drink wine all day. Yeah, Why right. Not? That's what happened. <laughs> If only. Um, yeah, so, so, but I was one of those people who, you know, I got this great job at KOW. I figured, you know, once you're there, you figure out your way up until you get to do what you wanted to do, which is, you know, host the next big show. Be the first uh, or second uh, female anchor host on KOW. It was, yeah, you know, part of my hope of a, of a talk show. Um, but rather than doing that, I end up getting this opportunity to move to Rome um, which, you know, you would think that would be an amazing thing. Uh, but when my husband Derek got offered this fellowship, I let him apply because I thought there was no way in hell he was going to get it. And then he did get it. It was a worldwide search. Who would have guessed? Um, he would have been one of the seven people. Uh, and he did get it. And uh, you would think that that would have been a really great thing. But for me, it was a great thing, but I was um, not sure I wanted to go. Uh, or at least not sure I wanted to admit my, to myself that I wanted to go. And then I thought about Tiffany. And I thought, you know, of all the places that I could have been offered to live abroad. By the way, you know, I'm not a big European traveler. I'd been to Europe once for her wedding. That was it. Um, and the only place I get offered to live is the one place where I actually know somebody. Somebody. <laughs> this somebody. Somebody. Your old oldest friend. friend that you met on the school bus when we were 10? I can't 11? say oldest. I do have Okay, oldest. one of. Uh, but yes, one of my oldest friends who I met on the school bus in the sixth grade happens to live in that city, which, you know, to be honest, me being a foot-dragging, nervous, not really wanting to move person, which my mother could tell you doesn't even like to spend the night at other people's homes, uh, person, part of the reason I could go was because I knew you were there. So, and because I'd been to her wedding and I knew at least one good pizza place. 
Uh, Dar Poeta. So, and then of course, because of that, this show exists. And here we are, 200 episodes in. And I'm not going to say this show brought about the book, but it might have had something to do with bringing you some of you here. Oh, well, of so, course it did. I think, I mean, I think it one all person is in particular, right, Derek? <laughs> um, so, is so, that a synchronicity? I, th I think so, but you know, don't don't ask me. I think that everything is synchronicity. I guess it well, sounds you don't like earlier. No, I don't. But I think that the fact that this show came about because you moved to Rome, and the fact that I lived there, and and Derek randomly got this almost impossible fellowship. I think these are all things working together. Now, whether or not it's synchronicity, I don't know, because I feel like with synchronicity, you do have to kind of put something out there. But maybe you wanted a new project, and you somehow put it out there, even subconsciously, and things clicked into place. You'd mm. have to answer that. I did have my old wise woman. That it was the uh, psychic that me and my assistant producer went across the street to see what it was all about. <laughs> uh, a $5 psychic moved in across the street from KOW. And so right before I left, we went over to see her, and I said, I don't know if I'm supposed to go. And she said, I think you already know what you want to do. Oh, that's classic. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not worth five bucks. Uh, I can say <laughs> that. Uh, but it worked, because I was like, I do. You do. Well, that's uh, all you needed, see? Anyway, see? we should leave it there. OK. This is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. Join us again. Bye. <laughs> Nice work. So, there's a microphone somewhere, or is there not? Oh, it's over there. Does anybody have any Maybe questions? we could raise the lights just to... Oh, there hi. We go. I said oh. it and it happened. No, no, do it. <laughs> synchronicity. Talk about synchronicity. No, it, that's good. Yeah. So, does anyone have any questions? Walk over to this mic. <laughs> yeah. Wait, walk over here if you have one, because we're, we're taping it for the um, audience at home, or wherever they may be. So my question is, I think that the creative urge manifests in many, many different ways in the single lifetime. But I'm curious to know what the connection you feel is from your studying opera to go into writing. That's a good question. Well, um, it's, I think it's all connected, but maybe in a string, like not necessarily like a web, but in a line. Opera, loving opera, led me to want to live in Italy mm -hmm. because opera led me to the Italian language, it led me to Italian culture, and it eventually led me to traveling to Italy. I studied for brief periods. I studied opera in Italy when I was in college, and I fell in love with a place because of those experiences. But strangely enough, what really brought me to love opera, so maybe it's not a line, maybe it's a circle, was a movie called A Room with a View that I saw when I was 12 years old and I became obsessed with it. You guys know about this. Uh, <laughs> obsessed. And if you've seen the movie, you know it opens with Kiriti Kanawa singing an aria from Gianni Schicchi from Puccini. And later, another aria by Puccini. And I... I think watching that movie, it, it sparked the love of both Italy and opera. For me, it was just kind of intertwined. And I still love opera. I still listen to opera. I still would practice if I had time. Um, but um, I think that led me to Italy, specifically Rome, and Rome became my muse. Rome became the, the font of all of my ideas. All of my creativity comes from that city. And um, yeah, I think maybe the pinnacle of all of that was my wedding day when my amazing friend Maeve, who's an opera singer, professional opera singer, sang one of the arias from that film at my wedding. The only moment I cried all day, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Truly a fairy tale moment. Thanks for that. So since this is an ongoing podcast, you may not want this question, but I figure you can edit it out. <laughs> so, so how do you guys do a podcast with one of you in Seattle and one of you in Rome? Skype. Yeah. <laughs> so this is what makes my job harder. Yeah. It, it's way easier when we tape together in Rome, which is part of the reason why I'm flying there in two days. Um, but 
Uh, how we do it is we get on Skype with each other. Uh, I tape my side with a microphone. Tiffany tapes her side with a microphone. Uh, she sends me the tape. And then I painstakingly stitch it together, which you would think it would just line up right on top of each other. Like, oh, uh, you know, we're talking at the same time. Why wouldn't it just line up yeah, together? Why doesn't it just line up? It doesn't. <laughs> One, because we start taping the tapes at a different time. Of course. Uh, partly because Skype has a delay, so you often react ah. to me at a different time. Oh. Um, and so part of my job is to make it sound like we're talking in the same place together. And so sometimes that's as nitpicky as moving a laugh around a bunch of times that so sounds like I laugh at the right time or she laughs at the right time. Um, because there's a sense that you get after you edit radio for a long period of time where you, can, you feel that like in your body. You can hear the rhythm of it where you can say, wow, that just didn't sound natural. Like, you know, she was just too, <laughs> like right on, I barely stopped saying what I was going to say, you know, so you'll delay her. Um, and I also do like uh, a lot of cleanup, like the cleanups of pauses. We both talk a lot uh, cleaner. Uh, Tiffany doesn't say like and you know very much, you know, where she does in real life. <laughs> uh, so I do take a lot of that stuff out, too, in the meantime, because i got to sync the tapes anyway, and that's already going to take a long time. So, And then it's a lot of, like, you know, coordinating the time difference, too, because she's always nine hours ahead of me. So, yeah. so we can only tape when it's, like, 9 p.m. for me because I have to get my kid into bed before we can tape, and so... So I'm always like a little sleepy and you're always like trying to find time in the middle of the day. Yeah. So it helps that I don't have a day job anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Thank thanks. You. Hey, Jenny. Hi, Katie. Hi, <laughs> Tiffany. Hi. Um, so my question has to do with your friendship. Uh, first part of this question is I would like to know a little bit more about Quacky. Oh, no. Please. Um, Quacky can babysit. Yes, and after we've heard about Quacky, I'd like to know <laughs> what is the easiest part of working together as friends on a podcast, and what is the hardest part? Oh, God. Well, Quacky is a voice I used to do. Oh, come on. You got to do it. I don't even know if I can still do it. Yes, you can. You can only say one thing. All I can say is Quacky can babysit. Say it in a voice. Quacky can babysit. <laughs> it's one of the things that happens when you're in theater together. <laughs> you were talking about needing a babysitter, and I said something like, or I forget I what it was. Somebody was talking Somebody. about babysitting. Um, I offered my services. Yeah, so. <laughs> uh, uh, the, it was better back then. Um, the, easiest thing about, or the easiest thing about working together? I think the easiest thing about working together is that we know each other so well, and we can probably a little bit um, anticipate what the other person might say or do. And also, we don't worry about ever offending each other because we know each other so well that it's just not, it's not an issue. Um, I, if I say something really like rude or you know, obnoxious, I know that she knows that's not who I am, so I can, I can get away with it. Yeah. Maybe. You know, sometimes I edit it out, you know. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot of power in my position. Um, no, the worst is when I say, can you cut this? And then she doesn't. Well, I only she don't leaves when it it's and funny. It makes me look bad. I only do it when it's funny. Um, <laughs> I mean, that said, I think that, uh, like, I don't think I knew her like I do now. I, you know, no. to be honest, we, we hadn't, um, we kept in touch, but we hadn't really kept in touch with her being gone so long uh, in Rome. We'd, we would send each other letters, and when she came to visit, we would hang out, but... Um, yeah, we but would go at least a year, two, three years without seeing each other sometimes. I remember her calling me once, uh, really upset about a breakup with a guy I didn't even know she was dating. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so that's how far it used to be. But yeah. I mean, it now that we were. It changed when she moved to Rome and we were living <laughs> on the same street. Yeah. So I think that also, like, we, it helps that we know each other, but I think that we know each other in ways that are so deep now that it's, um, like, I didn't know how she felt about most of the things that we talked about and because we always talk about like really specific kind of deep things often I think we talk about things that normal friends don't even talk about um, yeah and we talk for an hour every single week yeah. to record our podcast and we talk about you know ideas and and things like that so we've gotten to know each other thanks to the podcast yeah much better what's the hardest thing I think the hardest thing is the um, 
the distance, you know, for me, just because um, when you're trying to like run, I, it's hard to call this a business. <laughs> um, you know, it would be nice if like one day it was a, a little bit more sustainable than it is now, but like when you're trying to run a business and you're trying to build up like a listenership and a, you know, get more and more people to know about it, like working together on that is really hard when you not only one have to put out a podcast every single week, which was partly my fault because I decided we were going to be weekly, but um, but also because it's hard to coordinate. You know, if she's at the end of her day, I'm starting mine, um, and so unless we like write out tasks and trust each other to do them, uh, yeah, it's things easy, aren't really. It's easy to get away done. with something when it, you're co-worker, almost boss, I mean, you're not my boss, but she is the lead, like, the, 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 the head producer, let's say, you know, when she's your close friend, and you can be like, oh, yeah, I know I was supposed to do that, but I didn't do it, sorry, yeah. you know, it's easy to kind of make excuses for yourself, and so that might be a negative of being such good friends. Yeah. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Randy. Hi, guys. Hi. Randy. Um, so I'm going to go back to when you were little. Yeah. <laughs> Randy um, was. Randy, by the way. Go. go. He go. was our director. We did plays at the Youth Theater Northwest, and Randy was one of our amazing directors. And I, I want to ask you guys about that, because there was such an incredible spirit. And, and think about what people have done, that, that group of people, so many vital, creative, uh, amazing people. I mean, uh, you know, there, Megan Hill is, is, you know, acting her heart out in New York City, and, and Annie is, you know, in yeah. Hollywood. Yeah, and, Suzanne uh, Morrison wrote a book. And Je Joel, I mean, even Joel McHale was part of that group. Yeah, Kate um, Hess. Yeah, Kate. Great uh, character actor. So, um, and, and I always thought it was just such a wonderful environment, but what do, you, what do you think that gave you those days working with that incredibly creative group of people? It gave us you, Randy. I, well, yeah. I wasn't... <laughs> I wasn't feeding that to you. <laughs> no, I mean, they were, uh, you had great teachers. I was not one of their teachers, so I'm, I'm saying that. But you were but, a director, which yes. is, I think, mm, as much as important, if not more. He was also the director of me and Tiffany's favorite play that we were ever in. Mm -hmm. uh, which one? Snow, Snow White and the Seven Dogs. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, you were the director of that, right? I think so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, he was. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Animal, was. Were you an animal farm, too? I was no. not. I was okay. that, I, okay. My sister was. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was right. really little yeah. at that time. Uh, but that's such a hard you, question to answer. You go ahead. Go? No, go. No, I mean, I think that, I, th I speak for both of us, but tell me if I'm wrong. I think that our time at the youth theater um, absolutely influenced our future selves, not just theatrically, but just in general, like learning how to speak in front of people, learning how to tap into our creativity, learning how to just be ourselves and not care if we were weirdos. Yeah, how to focus how not to judge too much, how to work hard on something. I think also like the camaraderie of, um, you know, how you work with people. When you're in, in a theater. cast, you really feel like a family for that period of time. Yeah, but it was also about around, I think also it had to be around being around really creative adults all the time. I think it kind of takes it from this mythical land where how could you ever make a job that's creative and puts it in a look at all these people who are around you being creative. Uh, it made it seem more possible. I don't know why in particular, though. It does seem like whatever class that was sprung out in particularly grand ways, and I'm not sure why that is. Uh, whoever the teachers were at that time were geniuses. That's, that's what I put it behind. <laughs> <laughs> or we were, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe both. Joel. Hi. Um, okay, all that's great, but back on the topic <laughs> of synchronicity. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering what your thoughts were on the nature of synchronicity, always always maybe having to be a beneficial coincidence, and ah, perhaps ooh. maybe there's a dark side to that, because ooh. in order for something to go ooh. right for someone, sometimes it has to go wrong for somebody else. Oh my gosh, so let me get my notebook out, i got to make notes <laughs> for my next book. So I just wanted <laughs> I to down. know if your work explored any of that, or what your thoughts on that were. Wow, do you have a good story on that, Joel? Or? No, no. <laughs> Joel Israel, my high school boyfriend, everyone. Uh, <laughs> thanks for being here. Um, <laughs> boy, that is a tough question. I got to leave that one to you. This is your this is your topic, man. Um, I'm fascinated right now, and I want to go like write some notes. That that I've never ever thought about synchronicity having a dark side. Um, 
And yes, I, I have seen and read stories about, you know, something going wrong for someone, so going wrong for, for someone else, but I've never put it in that context. But I can't say that I have anything interesting to say, but thank you for that That's idea. That's really <laughs> brilliant. I guess and that little boy that was hoping to keep that duck. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good example. <laughs> oh my God! Yes. Hey, Mike. By the way, we had a duck too, but he, we named him Ducky Poo for, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, Mike Strong, uh, episode. You know what? You and Sunny. One thirty-three. One thirty-three. He was a guest. Uh, so one comment about the dark side. I think there there definitely is a dark side synchronicity because. Uh, if if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, another way of putting it, yeah. as opposed to being in the right place at the right time, you can do different things with that. It can kill you, bury you, or you can take it and build something from it. Hmm. So I think uh, there's very much a connection on that side. Uh, my question actually was uh, kind of a technical one. Uh, we just got back from Rome, and um, I note that when you ever, when you go to the common sort of touristy places like Piazza Navona or whatever. There's tons of people around and they're all kind of curious. As an example, we were walking through the piazza and there was a little trio playing there and whenever there's a band playing, Sonny and I always dance. <laughs> and so we were dancing this, this great music and the next thing you know, we've got a hundred people crowded around us with their video cameras taking pictures, right? So I picture you guys, when I'm listening to your podcast, when you were doing the tours around Rome, mm -hmm. and I've seen your equipment. Yeah. You've got this <laughs> long pole. Did you have to deal with crowds wondering what the hell you're doing? I wouldn't say crowds, but we definitely <laughs> had the random Roman guy who's like, okay. Like when Katie put the microphone down into the fountain to hear the water, and they're like, she's interviewing a fountain. <laughs> Luckily, they said it in Italian, so I didn't know. Yeah, it was like a trash collector um, guy who was very dapper. The trash collectors in Rome are really good looking. Maybe. Yeah, good, Just gorgeous. Just an aside. Um, but yeah, I think we got the occasional odd look. Did you put out a hat, Mike, when you, did, when you had all those people? We, you could have yeah. made some money. Uh, did you put... No, but you know the band loved it. I'm I sure. bet they did. Yeah. Because actually, we, this particular time, this has happened before to us in different places in the world, but because we're dancing all the time, that's how we met. But uh, the, the guy with the band had his hat out there and he, and he started selling CDs, but most of the people around there were kids, like uh, with the University of Rome sweatshirts mm -hmm. and they were all touring or something, you know, they were in groups. And then the, the young kids started trying to dance the way we were dancing, which was great. So it, it became like a featured event. So I'm just picturing you guys yeah. doing something similarly when you were out yeah. uh, listening to the sounds of the bells or the birds or whatever you were doing at that time. You know, what's interesting is um, I don't think I would have noticed necessarily uh, because I've been on the street with a microphone a lot <laughs> in my career. And I, I guess I noticed that like people somewhat pay attention, but what I'm thinking about is miking her right, miking me right, and I'm listening to the sounds that are going on around me, you know? So I'm like hearing the fountain and I'm noticing that there's a flock of starlings that are about to go overhead or I'm hearing that like, you know, some guy's making some interesting sound from back here. And so I'm almost more audi audio than visual at that point because I'm, gonna, I'm trying to create an audio soundscape. So I'm paying attention to the environment but not visually. It's, it seems to me what's <clears throat> changed, excuse me, is that now everybody has a video camera. Mm -hmm. So that's different than what it was 10, 15 years ago. So if something is happening, everybody immediately has their cell phones out and they're either taking a picture or they're recording you. Yeah. So did you have that experience? Not that I was aware of. Um, I think people just thought we were freaks, quite honestly. Like, what's this deal with this audio um, giant microphone and no camera? And what are they taping? Like, Why is Tiffany moving her hands so much? <laughs> Especially when it's just audio. Like. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it, actually, in an episode that's not out yet, but is about to be out, it might be the next one, I don't remember. Um, there's a woman who... 
who I'm interviewing, who I'm telling her a story about um, this, the experience of living in New Orleans and uh, marching in one of the New Orleans parades. My friend next to me playing the trumpet. And how weird of an experience it was. And we're in like full clown costume, right? <laughs> Which is not what I would normally be doing. Um, and although I loved it. Uh, and we're marching down the street and there are all these people who are not only filming us, but filming themselves in front of us. Like this kind of thing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Live streaming um, or something like that. And I thought, what a weird world we live in that that is going on. Not, they're not watching the parade. You know, they're not a part of the parade. They're showing other people that they're at a parade that yeah. they're not at. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was telling her this story and she said, let me be the one that's dancing or something like that. And I thought that that, you know, was such a great comment. Like, let that not be me, let me be the one that's dancing. She might have said it not dancing or marching, I forget, but I thought that was so profound. Nice. Maeve. Hi, girls. So, Katie, when I think about synchronicity, actually, I think about when I met you, <laughs> and maybe we could speak to this, but from what I understand, when I met you at Tiffany's wedding, you brought your now husband that you knew for like a week or something. Yeah, a little you longer. You want to tell that story? Oh, it was a little longer. <laughs> a little longer. Like a month or something? I didn't know him very well. Um, sure, yeah, I had met him um, in a class. We were in the community, the Seattle Community Police Academy together. Interesting, random. The Community Police Academy. It doesn't lead to any kind of police work. Um, it just <laughs> teaches you about the police department. Um, and I met him there, um, and, you know, it wasn't like a instant love connection. We just had, a, like, a really interesting discussions with each other. That's, that's it. Like, we just always had, whenever we would talk, we would talk about something really fascinating, and it would always be like, oh, I got to go, and then we'd end it in the middle of this great conversation. So when Tiffany's wedding's coming up, this is, sorry, I could go on so long. There's way too many details. But Tiffany's wedding's coming up, my dad... Sorry to bring you into it again, Dad. Um, my dad has had, at that point, been diagnosed with terminal brain cancer, I think. Um, he's still here. He, it all worked out. Um, <laughs> thank God. Um, anyway, and so uh, I, wa I was in Tiffany's wedding, but I will admit that I, while I was excited that she was getting married, I wasn't very excited to actually go on a big trip at that period of time. And so I was just gonna basically fly in, do the wedding, and fly back out again. And Derek, who I didn't know very well at the time, said, well, why don't you let me come with you and I'll make it into a trip that's fun. Like, if you're gonna go all the way to Europe and you've never been there before, make it an adventure. And so he planned to fly into Portugal, drive across Spain or something like that, and end up at the wedding. And so, yeah, I guess the point being, like, I guess I knew him pretty well after that. And uh, a year later, I think a, almost it was a year almost to the, to day, the day, a year later, I they married got him. married. And my dad married us. So. I just remember that story. I mean, I remember being there and people being like, she just met him. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't even know this guy. you're like, who is that dude? Um, uh, and just true. I didn't really know him. I'm, that's when I met him. I was at my wedding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just same I, with like Suzanne and half the people here. I mean, I just lo I love diving into this world of synchronicity. Tiffany knows that I'm all about the magic land um, as an opera singer, but, but it's just as a creative spirit. So um, I'm super excited to read the book. But turning it to you, Tiffany, in terms of synchronicity and your love, Claudio, I think too you also had a very synchronistic uh, event when you met him that night. Yeah, a little bit. Um, I was uh, sort of dating someone else, um, but it wasn't serious. And we were invited to go to a, um, a party on the Via Appia Antica, those of you who know Rome, way out on an ancient Roman road with aqueducts around and stuff. And it was a Roman costume party. And it was in a place that was used as practice for people who study the art of gladiator fighting. And so I was all excited for this party, and I got my costume all together, and I was going as a Roman matron. 
And at the last second, the guy that I was supposed to go with decided not to go. And I was like, well, I'm going anyway. I got my roommate or somebody to go with me. And um, we went. And as soon as we got there, my beautiful friend attracted some Italian guy. And she was already kind of drunk by that time. And he was trying to pick her up. And while he was trying to pick her up, his friend started talking to me. And that was my husband. Yeah. <laughs> and he was dressed as a gladiator. He was, no, he was dressed as a Roman centurion. Oh, sorry, my bad. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and he was not even supposed to be there because the night of the party, he broke his toe getting out of the shower. Yeah. His big toe. And, or he was a little one. I don't know. But he broke his toe. He also was getting sick. He was losing his voice. And the only reason he went was that he had spent 100 euros on his costume. <laughs> and he was like, I am not letting this costume go to waste. And so that's how it ended up. See, but neither one of those stories, based on our conversation, would I necessarily say are synchronicity. Well, that's no, the answer. No, but maybe it some meaningful coincidences. I actually have a, a, a bit of a synchronicity story. It's, it's, I just don't, I just don't want to go too long. Yeah. But um, we it's, should do the, our one last question. Okay. <laughs> Unless everyone really wants to hear it. No, 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 no offense. No, no it's but fine. we are she running along. Me. I don't That's want the, job. Sta the staff to have to say. Hi, Casey. Hi, Katie. Long time listener, first time question asker. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Uh, a common theme in your show is fountains, and I'm very curious in public spaces. Uh, can you kind of elaborate on the cultural significance of fountains and what Americans can learn from Italian fountains? Ooh, Ooh I love smart it. guy. Well, I could, I, I could go on and on, so I'll try not to, but um, in ancient times, <laughs> um, water was extremely important in ancient Rome, and that was really their thing. The way that they were able to harness water was what set them apart from other powers, that they were able to create these the system of bringing water into the city. It gave them incredible, um, you know, agricultural um, benefits as well as machine power for machinery and just having safe drinking water for the people to drink. And so as the Romans were building the aqueducts, generally when the aqueduct would get to the city, wherever it entered the city, they would build what they called a show fountain at the spot. And it was a way of showing off that Rome had so much water that they could just throw it away. And just, literally, that's what they did. And so there were a lot of fountains in ancient Rome. I don't know how beautifully designed they were, but there were fountains that, you know, just shot water out of them. Fast forward several hundred years, uh, the aqueducts were destroyed, um, or at least broken, in around the 5th century AD. And Rome you know, coincidentally or not, that's the time that Rome really went into decline uh, because they had no more water. Fast forward another thousand years, at the dawn of the Renaissance, they start rebuilding those aqueducts. Around 1450 is when they started rebuilding the aqueducts. And the first pope to do that, Pope Nicholas V, decided, I just dropped that name to impress you. Um, <laughs> she is a tour guide for hire in Rome, if you um, he decided that at the end of the Vir Virgo aqueduct, he was going to build a fountain where three streets met, Tre Vie, or Trevi. And so he built a very small, insignificant fountain there. 200 years later, Candy, you've heard this story. She's been on my tour. Uh, 200 years later, in the late Baroque neoclassical, early neoclassical period, another pope decided to make it into something fantastic. So that's kind of the story of the Trevi Fountain, but it's true for many of the fountains in Rome. And if you, if you study in a decent guidebook, you can see most of the fountains, they'll tell you this, the, this, this, aqueduct, this fountain is fed by such and such aqueduct. And this, they still, the aqueducts that were repaired still feed Roman fountains. So I think that there, in the Renaissance, the, the popes wanted to try to recapture the greatness of ancient Rome and shine that light back on themselves. And one of the many ways that they did that was by repairing the aqueducts and building more and more fountains. But culturally now, what would you say that the fountains roll in Rome, like Rome I as think, it moves as a city is? I think point? the fountain is a magnet for people. 
And a lot of times there are little steps around the fountain and people will gravitate to the fountain. Um, first of all, it's really refreshing in summer to sit next to a fountain because the air hits the water and it's kind of like a natural air conditioning. So I think, um, I think that's probably culturally what it's all about. It's just most major squares in Rome have a fountain in them and in, in, in most Italian cities as well that, that draw the people there. Thanks so much for coming, everyone. Uh, Tiffany will be signing books in the back. You can buy one if you don't have one yet, but most of all, thanks for coming and stick around and say hi if you know one of us. Or even or if you don't. Us. <laughs> or even if you don't. And if you have a copy of the book that you didn't buy here, I will sign it anyway. I mean, I will sign that too. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much.